Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Okay, great. So let's talk about becoming a hybrid work leader. So focusing on hybrid work, by the which I mean all non-standard office-centric work, meaning some values in the office or fully remote. This is what we'll talk about. So we'll focus on hybrid work. And we'll specifically, this is the structure of the presentation that you can expect. The first part of the presentation, we'll talk about the data. So the data on what people prefer, what the research shows about hybrid work. So data, project managers I know, like data, so we'll be data focused. Then we'll talk a little bit about some of the errors that people make in approaching hybrid and remote work. And then we'll talk about some best practices for how do you actually do hybrid and remote work effectively. So that's the shape of the presentation. That's what you can anticipate. Now, without further ado, let's talk about decision-making around hybrid and remote work. And I want to steer you in a little bit of a different direction than hybrid and remote work. Initially, I want you to be, think about lunch. We're doing a pre-lunch talk, or maybe it's lunchtime now for you. And let's imagine for lunch, you go to your freezer and you see that you have an option of some ice cream to eat. And you have two ice creams specifically. One contains 10% fat, the other is 90% fat free. So again, one contains 10% fat, the other is 90% fat free. They're the same otherwise. 10% fat or 90% fat free. Which of these sounds more appealing to you? Let's do a little poll and see what people prefer. Which ice cream would you prefer? 90% free, fat free, or 10% fat? Please go ahead and vote. See, more than two thirds of us voted. Let's give five more seconds for those who haven't voted yet. Okay, so we see that two thirds of us would prefer the 90% fat free and only a third would prefer 10% fat. But if we think about it, I mean, your project managers, you know how the numbers work. 90% fat free means it's 10% fat. 10% fat means it's 90% fat free. These are factually the same thing. They are, there's no difference between these two ice cream options, but there's definitely a clear preference here for 90% fat free. Now, why is that? Why do we have such a preference for something that is literally the same? Well, it because of something called the framing effect. The framing effect. How information is presented to us, how we think about it, how we perceive it, really shapes our beliefs, our actions, our desires. And that includes hybrid and remote work. So how do we frame our thoughts, perceptions, beliefs, desires around hybrid and remote work. What is the perception? What is the broader framework in which we think about hybrid and remote work? The key here is that lots of leaders say things like people are our greatest resource. And that's a framing that people, that leaders often use. But many leaders don't really live by that principle. They don't really actually use that frame when they approach hybrid and remote work. They're very comfortable with traditional office culture because they've been successful in traditional office culture. They don't know how to lead very effectively. They don't know how to manage people or projects very effectively in hybrid settings and remote settings. So many leaders, I see them wanting to turn back the clock, people like Elon Musk and Tesla and now Twitter and so on, very vocal people, you know, Jamie Dimon and JP Morgan, other companies who want to turn back the clock and deny the reality of this really major disruption that came from the pandemic. Instead, what I strongly encourage you to be thinking about and helping leaders who you interact with others to think about is to have a different frame around hybrid remote work. Don't see it just as a loss, as a problem. See it as a major disruption that provides an opportunity it's a disruption that provides an opportunity to maximize productivity and engagement. We very clearly see that hybrid work, remote work, very much 
facilitate productivity and engagement. In order to really get our goals from hybrid work and remote work, we need to put aside our what makes us comfortable, our habits, preferences, assumptions, and focus really on our business objectives. What are the goals of the project you're trying to manage of leading a team? What are your actual goals there? And how can you succeed in achieving those goals rather than simply doing what's comfortable? And how can the leaders that you interact with, how can you help them look at the business objectives and outcomes rather than what's personally comfortable for them? To do that, we need to overcome decision-making cognitive biases about the future of work, which we'll talk about, and we need to integrate best practices on effective work arrangements that are well adapted to the future of work. So that is what the presentation is about. How do you actually accomplish these goals? First, data, like I promised. There are eight major independent surveys from organizations like the Harvard Business School, Stanford University, National Bureau of Economic Research, from Society for Human Resource Management, which don't have a stake in any particular outcome. And they give pretty clear answers. That's 75 to 85% of workers don't want traditional office-centric work. 25 to 35% want full-time remote work. In fact, I just saw LinkedIn come out with data showing that 15% of all job postings are remote, but they attract about 50% of all candidates. So 1-5% of job postings are for remote work, but they attract 5-0% of all candidates. 40 to 55% would leave their job if forced to come in full-time. So we very clearly see that there's a something like 5-ish percent would quit on the spot if forced to come in full-time, and then something like 40-ish percent to 55, depending on the survey, and the industry would look for a new job. And over 70% are less likely to leave if offered substantial remote work, so over half their work week. Remote employees, we know, are highly more productive, very clearly. Over 55% report higher productivity in surveys, and 15% report lower. So 30% you know, they report equal productivity. Very clearly, people are more productive. And that's not simply people reporting themselves. We see from employee monitoring software which monitors performance, that remote staff are 5% more productive. So people are definitely more productive. And there was a Stanford University study, so some review, peer-reviewed research, academic research, which showed that in May, May 2020, remote workers were overall 5% more productive. So definitely, clearly 5% more productive. What about over time? How did that change over time? Did they become more productive? Did people get become less productive? Well, in two years later, like, think about it for yourself. What would you guess? Well, what would happen by May 2022 when they redid the survey, the study? By May 22, people were 9% more productive working remote, 9% more productive. Why is that? Well, people got more used to working remotely. They found out they dealt with the disruptions. Teams learned how to collaborate together better. Leaders learned how to read. People learned how to communicate. Technology was upgraded both on the enterprise side and people improved their home offices and governments invested into infrastructure improvements, utilities, companies, and so on. So remote work got more productive over time. And we can anticipate that it will probably continue getting more productive as we're getting new technology like virtual and augmented reality and so on of, and artificial intelligence that's specifically customized for remote work out there. Now, we also know that remote and hybrid employees have better well-being, very clearly. So over 75% report feeling less stressed with remote work, 70% report better well-being, and 75% report being happier. And we see that people who are remote capable, who work, who are forced to go to the workplace, they definitely report being less happy, more burned out. So definitely very, very clear numbers there. Now. Given that, I'm curious about your own preferences for working style. So please go ahead and vote. Which of these is your preferred working style? OK, 
Okay, I see that most of us participated. Let's give five more seconds, those who haven't yet. Okay, so we see that for this group, there tends to be even more of a desire for remote work. So just under two thirds of you would want fully remote work. Of the rest, the plurality would want one or two days in the office and something like 15% would want three days or four days in the office. So under, so we have something like 85% would want substantial remote work, so meaning a lot of remote work more than half the work week. Good. Okay. So let's go on. So that's the data that I want to share with you about preferences and some research about hybrid and remote work. What about the mistakes that I talked about? Well, these are called cognitive biases. These are dangerous judgment errors that just come from how our brain is wired. And they speak to the fact that we are making intuitively some mistakes and leaders especially are making some mistakes around hybrid and remote work. One of the biggest problems is called the status quo bias, the status quo bias. It's a desire to maintain or get back to the status quo that we see as appropriate, as good, as one where we are successful. And if you think about leaders, they've been successful for 20, 30, 40, you tend to be senior employees, right? They have been successful for 20, 30, 40 years in their career through being in the office and they feel uncomfortable. I mean, I helped 21 companies transition to hybrid work and remote work. And I hear again and again, senior leaders tell me that they don't want to do hybrid work. They don't want to do remote work because they feel uncomfortable with it. They feel that that's not where they can be successful leading people. And so they fell into what's called the status quo bias. It's a desire to maintain or get back to the status quo and you downplay major disruptions from the pandemic, even though very clearly the pandemic has caused very serious disruptions. We're never going back to January 2020, no matter what Elon Musk thinks. The hybrid work of something like three quarters of all companies intend to have some hybrid work for us permanent post-pandemic work arrangements. We see that office occupancy compared to to prior to the pandemic compared to January 2020, office occupancy has been around the last numbers I saw were something like 47, 48%. And they have not risen since early September. So very clearly, we're not increasing that office occupancy significantly going forward. Now, another cognitive bias is called the empathy gap. The empathy gap. That's where we tend to underestimate the importance of other people's emotions, other people's feelings about their preferences on remote work and hybrid work. For example, the leaders who insist that others get back to the office full time, they think that, well, you know, we'll just get back to the status quo, uh, January 2020, and everything will be fine. And what they're misunderstanding is that there was a fundamental shift for many people around during the pandemic where they learned to much, much more value well-being and health and so on who with pandemic as a major issue and flexibility and well-being, including social time with friends and family, personal time, having a good, healthy diet and so on. So people learn to value these things. And that is something that leaders greatly underestimate. So that's called the empathy gap. And again, they also underestimate people's desire for flexibility. And finally, there's a bias called functional fixedness, functional fixedness. That's kind of like the hammer nail syndrome. You've probably heard the phrase that when you, you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Well, when you learn why, one way of functioning, one way of collaborating together, then you tend to apply that way of functioning to all sorts of other contexts, including where it does not fit very well at all. So that's what functional fixedness is about, where you perceive one right way of function, and therefore you shoehorn, you transpose office-based culture into hybrid work and remote work. And so then leaders feel that they can't be successful in hybrid settings and remote settings because they're trying to do things that are based on how they succeeded in hybrid work and remote work. 
uh, I'm sorry, in office-based work, and they're trying to impose that, shoehorn that into hybrid and remote work. And they're wondering, well, why am I not successful? And then they say, well, like, because I can't be successful in hybrid and remote settings, we need to all go back to the office. So they fail to adapt strategically to innovate anywhere and collaborate everywhere. Now, when you think about these cognitive biases, these dangerous judgment errors, which of these do you think might be most problematic for the future of work in your workplace? Please go ahead and vote. See about half of us vote. Let's give five more seconds for those who haven't voted yet. Please go ahead. Hmm. See, pretty clear. A pretty good balance, you know, a third, just under a third things the status quo bias, over a third things the empathy gap, and uh, just under a third things functional fixedness. So whichever one of these you think is the most important, you want to take some time and think about how it impacts your workplace, write some things down about it, maybe write down about all three, and then take the information back to your team, to your leadership, and help them understand where it might be a problem and how to address it. All right, so that's the first half of the presentation about these mistakes and the data. So the data are on hybrid and remote work and the mistakes we tend to make. Let's talk about some best practices for taking competitive advantage of the opportunity to maximize productivity and engagement. We very clearly see that the best model for the future of work is a team-led model, which involves most people being hybrid and a minority fully remote. Now, a team-led model, the way that's distinct from the typical model that a lot of organizations use is that the typical model is that the CEO decides, well, we're going to come back on you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And those are going to be the days that everyone comes back to the office, or maybe Tuesday and Thursday, and then everyone chooses another day. Right? That's kind of a atypical modality that organizations use. But that's the opposite of what should happen because the CEO doesn't need, know what each team needs. Different teams have different needs. Some teams will do great being fully remote. Some teams need more time in the office just because of the, what their nature of the team is. So you should have a team-led model where a team leader in consultation with a team decides what works best for each team. And the result of that, so what I see overwhelming is, Lee, is that there are going to be most people are going to be hybrid one to two days in the office that's the majority and then the fully remote employees are going to be a minority 10 but a substantial minority from 10 to 30 percent and 10 percent is something like that's might be a manufacturing company where you have to have you know a bunch of people who are on the factory floor and then some back office staff who can be come to the office occasionally or not at all and for closer to a tech company might be 30% or more fully remote, depending on the situation. And you want to adopt best practices for hybrid and remote work arrangements. Now, part of the best practices is to provide training on effective hybrid work, because lots of people don't know how to work well in a hybrid setting. It's neither fish nor foul. People aren't aware of what to do at home, what to focus on in the office because the only reason to come to the office is to do collaboration. That's the only reason to come to the office. We know that for the large majority of people, over 80%, people are better able to do focused work, individual work at home. So individual tasks where you need to focus on your own work. Collaboration is more of a wash. Some people, it depends on personality, prefer to, to do it at home, some people in the office. Overall, we see that more intense forms of collaboration are typically, not always, done better in the office. So you want to think about, okay, how much more how much intense collaboration do you do and how much does that justify going to the office? 
and you want to train people on how to do effective virtual communication and collaboration because without this training effective communication and collaboration that's often what drives leaders to get their teams back to the office because they feel well we can't collaborate effectively when we're remotely we can't communicate effectively you know what you can you just need to train people on how to do so effectively now At this point, I want to show you a brief video. Okay, you should be able to see my screen and then you should be able to now hear the sound. So this is gonna be a brief video from my consulting engagement for a major research institute in information sciences, which involves AI, cybersecurity, and so on. And so this is going to be a testimonial from the lead executive director of this 300-ish people institute about the consequences of my consulting for them. So please go ahead check this out and think and the point of this is the adoption by them of this team-led model and training approach and so this is the consequence of it uh gleb Zabersky came came to my attention sometime back during the pandemic when uh, i was planning to have our research institute uh follow the standard path that all the big corporations are following so apple and google were announcing plans to have people come back three days a week so i thought that seems like a good plan so we actually sent out a message said okay starting this date everyone's coming back three days a week uh and then you know can work from home two days a week uh and and then i saw a video that Lev actually a video talk that Lev actually gave for IEEE uh that really actually changed my mind about this and it was a video about hybrid work and how important it was to actually embrace it and uh uh, and one of the things I was impressed in the video is that all these interesting ideas about how to make hybrid work more effective and stuff. So I signed up for a meeting with Gleb and uh, uh, learned quite a bit more about, you know, how to do hybrid work well. And so Gleb has come on as a consultant for the Information Science Institute and has been really helpful in terms of putting us much more in a leadership position in terms of figuring out how to do hybrid work. So we changed our policies. We are much more flexible about who can work at home and and allowing people to work from home, you know, whatever makes sense with respect to their supervisor, uh, creating spaces in people's home offices, uh, figuring out how to onboard people in a way that, you know, when people haven't met in person, that is more effective. Uh, so I think he's been incredibly helpful in terms of really transitioning us to be a sort of a lead in, in how we manage hybrid work at the, at the Institute. So. It's been incredibly useful with all of Club's advice, and I appreciate all the help he's given us with respect to moving forward with this, our hybrid work plans. Okay. Now, with that in mind, what do you think would be the value to you and your team of integrating this team-led approach into your workplace? Please go ahead and vote in the poll. I see about half of us voted. The rest time to vote. Five more seconds. Make your voice heard. Okay. Good. So we see that substantially over 50% would find highly valuable. That's excellent. And so you want to take this methodology back to your team and work on integrating it. And I'll be happy to have a coaching meeting with you if you want. For those who found moderately valuable, think about what aspects of it might be applicable to you. And again, try to integrate that into your work. Great. Now, let's talk about some ways of solving some of the problems that I see with hybrid work and remote work. One of the biggest problems is a sense of how do we collaborate effectively together? How do we get things done? How do we help teams maintain social connections with each other? 
how do we integrate junior team members? Those are all serious issues and we want to make sure to address them. So let's talk about them. A really good approach is to replace in-person co-working with virtual co-working, which means working along team members on a video conference call. So what you do is you go into a video conference call much like this one, and it's for everyone, for fully virtual teams or hybrid teams on non-office days. So that's very helpful. So you sign into this one hour video conference call, and then you start, everyone starts by sharing the project on which they'll work. The crucial thing is this is working on your individual projects. So imagine you're in an open office and you're co-working and you're working with other people around you know, the shared office space, but you're not actually working on a shared task. You're working on your own task, but you can hear other people, you can see other people, so that is the point of it. So you share the project in which you work, and then you turn off your microphones, like you all did, so thank you for keeping your microphones off. Leave your speakers on, like you're all having, and your video is optional. Then you work on your individual tasks, but if you have questions, you can turn on your microphone and ask the question. If you have ideas that you want to brainstorm around, you, again, turn on your microphone and share. If you have a problem that you want to problem solve, the same thing, you turn on your microphone and share. And your coworkers get to answer those questions, discuss ideas, problem solve, and so on. And you can use screen sharing, you can use a number of variety of other software sharing tools to help in the discussion. And then you end by turning your microphones on and sharing what you accomplished during this period. Now, this is a very motivating activity. People like to leave their more unpleasant tasks for this period, which, you know, filling out reports and so on that um, most people don't like to do. So that's when I help clients do this, but that's what I see a lot. Of. And it's very helpful for helping teams bond because you get to connect, you get to chat with each other, you get to engage. It's especially, it's helpful for facilitating innovation in brainstorming, and it helps integrate junior team members. So it helps those junior near team members get on the job training. And the job training is of course, just quickly getting your questions answered by more senior colleagues and probably getting some mentoring from senior colleagues in those group settings. So very helpful technique. Now, this is virtual co-working and I'd like to hear your thoughts on whether this would be valuable for you and your team. Please go ahead and vote on that. About two thirds of the people voted. Good, let's give five more seconds for the rest. Oh, good to hear it, Ben. I'm glad that this is something that your team started doing a version of it. Good, so try out some of the more um, best practice methods of virtual co-working and see if it works out somewhat better for you. <laughs> Good, glad to hear it. All right, so we see that over half of you would find it highly valuable, that's excellent. So please take it and use it for your team and you can chat to Ben who is in the chat, so said that his team was already using it, which is great a version of it and he'll try to improve it based on this practice. So take it and start using it for your team. And again, you'll get some resources after the presentation, which will help you use it. Good. Now let's talk about another tool, which is very helpful specifically for innovation. So a lot of companies are saying, well, we need to collaborate better, therefore we need to go in the office. More program and companies that depend on innovation say, well, we need to innovate better. That's why we need to go back in the office, Apple, for example, or Google. But you can solve those problems. You can solve the problems of innovation. How do you innovate effectively? By using best practices, not shoehorning traditional office-centric methods into hybrid remote work, but using best practices for actually hybrid and remote settings. 
traditional brainstorming is the typical activity that teams use for innovation. So traditional brainstorming doesn't work very well in remote settings. And there's a lot of problems with it just because of the, you can't have the back and forth that you would in that typical brainstorming room. But traditional brainstorming has a lot of benefits, but it also has some serious problems even in the typical in-office settings. One is called production blocking. That's when you have an idea, but other people are talking about another idea and they're steering the conversation in a different direction. You lose track of your idea and that idea gets forgotten. Production blocking. That is especially typical for people who are more introverted, who have trouble interrupting others when they're talking, and for people who are junior on the team, so lower status team members, have trouble interrupting higher status team members when they're talking. Another is called evaluation apprehension. That's when you're worried about what other people will think about your idea. Maybe it seems a little bit off the wall, crazy, out of the box. Maybe it implicitly criticizes another team member, their territory activities or so on. And this, and you saw you don't share the idea. This is especially problematic for people who have a more pessimistic personality. So rather than optimistic, people who see the glass as half empty. And for people, again, who are junior on the team, who don't want to implicitly criticize more senior team members. Finally, social loafing. So our brains are wired to not be very productive. They're wired to be lazy, to be honest, because they're wired to save energy, conserve energy. That's really important as part of our brains. And so we tend to when we see other people doing hard brain work, we tend to slack off. That's just in our intuition. That's just how we are built. Nothing we can do about it. <laughs> and so the best number for people to have the, the highest number of ideas per person in a team brainstorming meeting is actually two people <laughs> because that's minimizes social loafing. So social loafing is a problem. Now, long before the hybrid work world and the remote world, this there was a methodology developed to address these problems called asynchronous brainstorming it was developed in harvard in the early 1990s and it was not didn't have anything to do with hybrid work and remote work it was just a, developed to address production blocking evaluation apprehension and social loaf now i took this methodology and i adapted it for hybrid work and remote work and i have a harvard business review article about this if you want to learn more so the virtually synchronous brainstorming solves all of these problems, and it's a very good methodology. It's especially helpful, as I mentioned, to junior and lower status team members, introverts, and pessimists. Let's talk about this methodology. What are the steps? First, what you do is all team members, you generate input ideas asynchronously and anonymously. So asynchronously, not at the same time, anonymously, without other people knowing about the idea. And then you input them into something like Google Forms, Microsoft Forms, Mural, and so on. So you get a spreadsheet or a whiteboard with notes on it as a result of this idea generation process. Now, so this is the first step. And the, the asynchronicity is especially helpful for introverted team members who don't suffer from production blocking as a result of it, because they can put their ideas and not have to interrupt anyone else. And lower status ones, again, for the same reason, you don't have to worry about it. It's very helpful also for, for distributed teams, people who are not located in the same area, the same city. You know, I, have a, I have a number of clients like uh, that are like Fortune, like uh, Fortune 200 high-tech manufacturer called Applied Materials, allowed me to talk about my work for them, who have many teams that are in the US, Singapore, Ireland, and so on, that are distributed across the world. So they need to collaborate. And that asynchronicity is very helpful for them because different time zones, different activities. So the asynchronicity is very helpful for distributed teams as well. Then anonymity is very helpful for people who are pessimistic because they're not going to be evaluated negatively and lower status ones. So this is very, very helpful. Let's see, somebody asks, how do you use maintain anonymity while using shared forms? So anonymity is pretty easy. When you have a Google form, you put you just put the Google form and you just put the idea we don't put the name it, it, it's, it's very simple so there's a google form is inherently anonymous nobody knows who, what your name is uh, so you don't put your name great 
not a problem at all because but that that's not an issue you can make it semi-anonymous you can put put have people put in their names and their ideas but only the leader sees the names or the facilitator if a facilitated many of these and then they strip away the names before combining it into a joint spreadsheet for everyone second you get a joint spreadsheet for everyone. So you get 40, 40 ideas from a team of six to eight people. You get, let's say, 40 ideas for a certain task. Everyone gets their own spreadsheet. And then you rate each idea on a certain number of criteria. For example, how innovative, practical, and exciting each one is. And that's, and then you also add comments. So now you have 40 ideas. And each person gave them anywhere from zero to 15 on the spreadsheet. So on their spreadsheet, and let's say you have six people. So now the leader gets their spreadsheet. And again, you can anonymize the spreadsheets because you can just create, a, easily create a Google account, which is anonymous. So nobody knows whose Google account that is. And so you just send those spreadsheets to the leader. And now the leader has six anonymized spreadsheets from anonymous Google accounts. And then the leader combines the scores for each one, just use the sum function. And so now you have 40 ideas. Each one is rated anywhere from zero to 90, where it's six times 15. So zero to 90. And you see very clearly which are the best ideas that bubble to the top. They're you know, ideas that have like you know 70 or 80 and above. So you can very clearly see which of these ideas are the most promising. And they can come, often they come from junior status junior team members or recent team members because they are the ones who bring the freshest thinking the most out of the box thinking and so that is the next step and then you have a lot of also comments on each one so you have on let's say you have as a result of this five ideas that are 80 and above that's what I often see, something like that and when you have four idea ideas all together you have five ideas that are 80 and above and you have most people left a comment on the idea so the last step is having a synchronous meeting to determine how to implement the best ideas. So you already, again, you, now that you know that these are the five best ideas, clearly, they got the highest scores, and then there's a number of comments on them. So now this is a synchronous meeting where you just, you don't have to worry about evaluation apprehension because you see which ideas are best, of, and regardless of who suggested them. And so then you get to, re, get to discuss the ideas using the comments, you improve the ideas and you assign them as next steps to other people. Now, especially helpful is that, let's say some of the ideas that are, let's say 70 to 80, these are still good ideas, but maybe they're not, maybe it's not the right time for these ideas. Maybe we're going into a recession, we just don't have the budget for these ideas. So then you put the ideas, you can put all of them into an idea bank. And you can store those ideas and you could say, well, let's revisit them next quarter. Maybe the situation will be better in you know, Q1 2023 uh, or Q2 2023. And so you can you don't have to do that work again. You know, the typical brainstorming session, you just lose all those ideas it, because they're like, oh, people are like, no, but those aren't good ideas. Here, they're all written down. You have a track record. It's very, very helpful that you can put them into the idea bank and they're all already rated. And you can easily, you can make notes on them saying you already have notes on them. So you know other things that people thought about them. And that's very helpful about these ideas. Now, the, there's been research on this that shows that altogether, this methodology creates more total ideas and more novel ideas than traditional brainstorming as rated by external outside reviewers. And yes, yeah, Sandra says step two is more evaluation of the ideas. Yes, the, that's exactly right. So step two, so step one is the initial idea generation. It's kind of going out. Step two is the evaluation phase of brainstorming. And step three is the implementation phase. And Ben says you don't have to come up with an opinion. Absolutely. So you don't have to come up with an opinion in real time. You can take your time. Yeah, and the same thing for step one. You, you can take your time to generate ideas. Again, the asynchronicity, very helpful for people who are introverted junior status team members. Uh, glad you like the idea bank idea, Denise. Now let me show you another video. This is going to be from Applied Materials, the Fortune 200 high-tech manufacturing company that I mentioned. So this is uh, 
Susan Winchester, the chief human resource officer for the for that company. It's about a 30,000 people company. Yeah, no, a little bit more. Uh, no, they, they hired 16,000 people during the pandemic, so it, it's probably around 45,000. Hi, I'm Susan Winchester, and it's my delight and pleasure to tell you a little bit about our experience with Dr. Gleb. He had a big positive impact at Applied Materials. Our leaders and engineers love data-based, research-based insights, which is exactly what he brings. He hit it out of the park. And he used a team-led process, which was incredibly engaging. He introduced us to a concept he created called asynchronous brainstorming. It was a process that we used with hundreds and hundreds of leaders globally at the same time. We did this during our CEO kickoff session for our strategy work. And in a very short amount of time, we were able to get great benefits. I also love the work he's doing to educate leaders around the power and positive benefits of hybrid and virtual working. And one of his techniques that I'm planning to use, because I think it's so cool, is what he calls virtual co-working, where you and as many work co-workers, colleagues as you'd like, create a virtual meeting and no purpose or agenda, but rather just to be working with one another. So I highly endorse Dr. Gleb's work, love him. Okay, now, uh, given what you heard, what do you think about the using virtually synchronous brainstorming for you and your team? Please go ahead and vote. But two thirds of you voted. Let's give five more seconds. Great. So we see that everyone found it valuable to some extent. About half of you found it highly valuable, which is excellent. Take it away and use that methodology and you'll get resources to help you do so. And the other half of you found it moderately valuable. So decide what is going to be most applicable and use those parts that are most applicable. Excellent. Okay. So let's talk about the resources. I mentioned that, that you'll get some free resources. You'll get a copy of my best-selling book, Leading Hybrid and Remote Teams. And I'll be happy to do a coaching session for the first three claimants who will want one. And you'll be able to vote on a poll on whether you would like these resources. I'll also be happy at this stage to take any questions. Dr. Gleb, I had a direct question and I think you uh -huh. covered it as far as, um, will you be providing a copy of the presentation you provided today? Yes, I'll, I'll provide a link to the slides. Thank you mm -hmm. so for those much. Who vote, for those who want, who vote that they want a copy, <laughs> obviously. Right. So those that say yes to additional resources yes. would get a copy of the slides. Perfect. Thank you. Perfect. Sure. Any other questions for Dr. Gleb? This has been great. I actually took That's some awesome. of the stats and, and uh, copy and pasted them. We're in a hybrid model uh, mm. where I currently work. Uh, and they there's a lot of talks of trying to get us more in the office. But as PMs, as you saw in the survey, um, we're like, our collaboration is across the world. And mm -hmm. we like the virtual collaboration and working from home. So. It was, it was nice to see that my PM team is aligned with this PM team <laughs> yeah, as far yeah. as the voting goes. Oh, definitely. Absolutely. Yeah, PMs, I definitely see higher desire for remote work. Okay. So I'll end the poll. So Ben asks, has there been any studies or talking about the benefits of writing chat, chat box alongside verbal chat presenter in virtual work? Um, not that I know of, so I don't I have did not know of any research specifically on the chat box, but it's definitely good. 
So a best practice for when you're in a hybrid meeting to be paying it for people who are in the room to be paying attention to the chat box, to what people are saying or who are coming in remote. Paul asks, any thoughts on how to point out leaders' biases? I would just say that, hey, here's what I learned from this presentation. Do you think that there are any impacts from these biases on our work? So not saying that you, uh, you Bob, you know, leader have a, have a bias, but say, here's what I learned. I think this is really cool. I, I wonder if there's any impact on this in our work. What do you think? And so having that curiosity and just saying that you just learned about this, you're bringing valuable information from a professional development opportunity to the team. It's always good to learn, right? And then you're starting a conversation and that conversation might reveal some interesting things about what's going on in your workplace. Oh, so Andrew asks about video and conference calls. There's very clear research that when you have video on, people have a more engaged experience and are more connected. So if you actually want people to be more engaged and connected to each other, you want to have the video on. And for so for more intense collaboration, for more engagement, you definitely want to have the video on. The problem with the video on for people who are introverted, which most project managers not all tend to be, is that it's more draining. So it's kind of a cost benefit analysis. When are you going to have your video on versus off? So you want to have your video on when you're collaborating, when you want a more engaging meeting, but if it's going to be not a meeting where you need to be collaborating or engaging, then you want to think about how do you save your energy and not have some of the Zoom fatigue that we can experience, especially the video exacerbates Zoom fatigue. So that would be the trade-off that you want to be thinking about. Oh, uh, virtual work has definitely been beneficial before 2020. There was a peer-reviewed study from Stanford University in 2015, which already showed that remote workers were substantially more productive, for example, than people who are working in office. So yeah, uh, definitely remote work has been quite beneficial already before 2020. You know, we had Zoom, we had Skype, we had other things already since the turn of the, for over a decade. It's just that companies didn't have a substantial reason to use it. And of course, there were already a number of fully remote companies, which were but those companies tend to be startups, which weren't yet large. And so that is that didn't have the traditional office-based culture. Other folks, you can chat or you can unmute yourself, whatever is most comfortable for you. Okay, so Mark says, yep. So Mark is, is an example of a company that's been 100% remote since 2009. Again, tends to be newer companies that are because they don't that don't have an established office-based culture that has been all remote. I mean, the company I run, Disaster Avoidance Experts, it's a six-people consulting company. It's it's been all remote since 2017 when I established it. So, yeah. Technology I'm most excited about. Oh, good question. Uh, so in the short term, I'm excited about technology that allows effective hybrid meetings. So there's technology that allows things to people to focus the camera to focus on you automatically when you speak while seeing the whole room there's something called an owl and other sort of similar technologies that are getting increasingly integrated with zoom and other platforms that allow this sort of focus that facilitate better hybrid meetings so i'm seeing that coming out starting to roll out now and that i think is very that i think is very exciting because i think hybrid meetings are probably the biggest challenge of hybrid remote work I'm excited in the also in the medium term. I'm excited about technology that allows more um, fun and social activities 
for people who are working remotely to engage with each other together because that helps people bond and that's very valuable. I think in the longer run, I'm really excited about virtual reality technology. I don't see it as kind of something in the you know six to twelve month period, but more you know twenty four to thirty six month period that will enable people to have much more ability to engage effectively with each other and experience each other's presence. And so you'll engage and communicate in many more your body tone, your facial expressions, and so on. So be able to convey that. That I'm excited about, but kind of a longer term. It's called Prezi video, so. It's a much more engaging technology than, as you can see, the much more engaging technology than PowerPoint. <laughs> Any more questions before I wrap up? Huh. Thank you, Paul, I appreciate that. Let's definitely, well, try to do best practices here. All right, everyone, I hope you enjoyed the presentation and have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time today and for sharing this information with us. I think we all have some takeaways and totally agree with Paul. Excellent examples. Really love the Prezi presentation and um, and like having your video right side by side with your slides. I totally agree. Mm -hmm. Way more engaging and we appreciate it. So thank you again for joining us today and for your presentation and look forward to seeing those materials that you send out. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you for your time. Thanks. Thank you all. Thanks. Bye-bye.